Welcome to Home Education Matters, the weekly podcast supporting you on your home education journey. Welcome to Home Education Matters and I'm very excited today to be joined again by Karen Bontron, the inclusion lead from Satro and Karen was on a very interesting podcast with us a few months ago about how to transition your child from school to home education and one thing I loved about the podcast was that all my expectations about what the local authority might think you should be doing compared to what home educators think you should be doing they were thrown they were thrown out they were thrown in the bin because it turned out that actually we all have the same approach which was really lovely and so I've invited Karen back on today to talk to us specifically about EHCPs because this gets raised quite a lot in the home education community but first of all Karen welcome again to the podcast and for anyone who hasn't heard your the original podcast do tell us a little bit about yourself Hi, it's it's nice to be back. It's not only my first ever podcast, but the first one I've ever returned to. So <laughs> thank Yay. you for that. <laughs> um, so my name is Karen. I have two jobs at the moment. I am the inclusion lead for a regional education charity called Satro. So we are a STEM education charity. So we take workshops to primary schools and secondary schools to help inspire students to look at STEM learning. So that's science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, We also run a construction BTEC course and we do some work around employability skills as well. So my role there as the inclusion lead is to take some of those things into sort of non-mainstream school sectors. So specialist schools, pupil referral units, alternative provision, and home educators. Then my other role, I am self-employed as a teacher for home educated students. So these are predominantly students with special educational needs who can't be in school for a multitude of different reasons or it's just better for them not to be. So I go and teach lessons at their homes and that is funded by the local authority. So I am often in their EHCP somewhere. (laughs) So you're the one that within the EHCP is, is one of the sort of accredited, if you like, tutors that, that the local authority will fund. Yes, exactly. All right. So let us launch into EHCPs. So when I was training to be a teacher back in the dim and distant past, it was called statementing. Now, is this the same thing? Is being statemented the same as having an EHCP or are they different things? So an EHCP is an sort of updated version of a statement. So this change happened in 2014. So this is back when I was, just before I qualified as a teacher, back when I was working as a learning support assistant. So the main differences for that is that the EHCP is much more child-centered. So there's much more space when you're developing that education healthcare plan to talk to that child or the young person and ask them their opinions, their views of what they would like it to say. Um, And there are also additional things such as personal budgets, which were not part of the statement. So a personal budget you can get as part of your EHCP plan. And that is money that the parent or guardian of that child or young person has quite a lot of control over how it is spent. So that's usually designated for things like equine therapy or um, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, that sort of thing. And it's very much up to the parent of that young person or the young person themselves, depending on their age, as to who they would like to spend that money on. So they are choosing where it's going. And that was a new addition. They didn't have that as a statement. So it sounds like the move from statement in to EHCPs is has been a bit more empowering for children and parents. Yes, that was one of the main reasons to do it was to increase that space for the family and the young person to express their views. OK, so what does EHCP stand for? And could you tell us what it is and who can access it? Yep, so EHCP stands for Education and Healthcare Plan. So it is a legal document that is written by the local authority in conjunction with 
the parents or guardian, the young person and the school, if there is one. Uh, so it's split into a few different sections. So section one is all about context. So it's who is this young person? Who do they have around them? So who are they living with? Who is their family? Any professionals who are currently working with them? Um, a little bit of information about their current situation. So are they in school? Are they not in schools? What's going on with them at this particular moment? Um, so, you know, how are they feeling? What, what might they be struggling with at that particular moment? There's also a section in that first bit as well for the views of the young person and their family as to what is going on and sort of why this EHCP has been requested. And a short summary from the local authority that comes from the initial assessment. So the first step in gaining an EHCP is to request an assessment from the local authority to see whether they agree that one is, is needed and can be created. So there'll be a short summary in that first section from the local authority saying, you know, yes, this is the situation. This is why we think the EHCP needs to be written. Your next section then is all about the needs of that young person. So what needs do they have that have meant that we are writing this plan? And that is split into cognition and learning needs, anything to do with communication, physical and sensory needs, social, emotional, mental health, physical health. So any you know, sort of health conditions that that young person might have and any social care needs that might be going on. So it's not just education then, it's much broader. Yes, it is. That is why they have now named it the Education and Healthcare Plan. It is much broader. It is looking at everything that is going on with that young person. And it also goes up to the age of 25. So once you have one, that stays with you and that provision is in place until the age of 25. So you have access to that provision and that support. Is there a minimum no. age? There's no minimum no. age. Okay, so like two-year-olds, whatever, can go for it. Yeah, can do. Okay. Yeah, you can have one for, for nursery schools. You can have one for childminders to use. So it sounds like it's quite structured and it's it's specific but broad, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, <laughs> so my next question is, you mentioned an initial assessment. And I'm guessing that initially these things get flagged up by teachers in schools. So could you talk us through the EHC po EHCP process in a school compared to the EHCP process if you're home educated and what the main differences are between them? Yeah. So the first step in the process is to request an assessment from the local authority. So you contact your local authority. You say, I think my child needs an EHCP for some extra support. Can we have an assessment? And that assessment can be requested by the parents or guardian of that young person, by the school, the nursery, the childminder, whoever is looking after them, and by the young person themselves if they are age 16 or over. Mm -hmm. So you can actually request one for yourself once you get to that age. The local authority will then request any reports that you might have from the school or education setting that that young person is in any doctor's assessments that you might have, um, diagnosis for special educational needs, things like that, um, or a letter from the parent or guardian explaining the needs of that child or young person. Yeah, I was thinking that as a home educator, some of those might be quite difficult to access. So I'm guessing in a school setting, is it slightly easier to get an EHCP just because you have all the different outside professionals being involved? It can be. It can be. It can be easier to gather the evidence because you've obviously you've got teachers, you've got learning support assistants, teaching assistants. You have lots more people around that child who will be able to provide evidence. Um, but it is perfectly possible to get one as a home educator. Like I said, you can request the assessment from the local authority in exactly the same way that school would do it. And then the local authority would send out assessors or things like that. Yeah, so they would gather the information that they've asked for. They'll have a look at it. They might want to have a meeting with you and the young person to have a chat with them about what's going on. Um, and they will tell you within 16 weeks if an EHCP is going to be created. 
for that young person. That's from first contact or is that from when they say, okay, we've looked at everything and now it will take 16 months? From the date that they receive your request for an assessment. Okay, that's not too bad then. And who do you contact in the local authority? Is there a department within the local authority that you need to contact to, to speak to like the EHCP officer or something? So you'll be looking at the education welfare department. Okay. So they will be on the website. There'll be someone there that you can contact. And does it involve social services at all? Um, only if they are already involved with the family, as they far as I'm aware. It, <laughs> it wouldn't necessarily no. like flag it up. Okay? Because it was just when no. you were mentioning that, that obviously part of the acronym is healthcare. And I wondered whether there was an element where social services then see themselves as kind of a dual role between education and social services. So they wouldn't normally be involved unless they are already in contact with that family. Um, like I said, there is that social care section in the EHCP, but that would be for something that is already happening in the context of that family rather than something that is happening because of the EHCP. I've got you. And so say, for example, that somebody has taken their child out of school and the EHCP process was part you know they were kind of part way through it is that something they could then request the documentation from the school that's already been you know that they're part way through or anything like that or would the local authority yeah. have that anyway yeah so you can request that from the school and the local authority to sort of take over that process mm -hmm. and say you know, and yes they're not at that school anymore so now I'm doing it so it's a little bit like when you can take your child's work from the school and you can say I want my child's work it's a little bit like that you can say yeah. I want the documentation OK, exactly. And it, yeah. What if they've never been to school um, at that point? They don't have a lot of um, documentation and things like that. They just have this letter that the parent is producing. Are there things that you would recommend a home education parent to amass alongside this? So are there things that, for example, you might you might sort of say, well, we've you've got your letter and you know exactly what what Bob needs. But but you need X, Y, Z extra evidence. Are there, are there things that you would recommend a home educating parent to think about getting as evidence? Well, one of the strongest pieces of evidence would be a letter from a medical professional or an educational psychologist with some form of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Now, that's obviously not possible for everybody. Um, but if you think there is something there, if you believe that your child or young person is in need of a diagnosis, I would say get that first, because then you can use that assessment, that report from that person as part of your evidence. And would that go through initially your local GP? Sorry, I know I'm asking yeah. you questions. About, yeah, <laughs> That's okay. okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so that would go, so you'd go to your GP and you'd say, do you know what? I think Bob has autism. And then they would be like, okay, I'll refer you to an educational psychologist. And yes. they would, and then you could be like, okay, I've got the diagnosis. Now I can go to the local authority and get my EHCP. Yeah, I've got my letter from that educational psychologist saying, yes, Bob has an ASD diagnosis. I can give that to the local authority and say, I'm now requesting an assessment for an EHCP because of this. Is it possible to get an EHCP without having to go the kind of labelling route, you know, where you're, you get put your child in for assessments and things like that? Because I know that quite a few home educated parents, they don't really like that, but some really like it and others don't. And that's the beauty of home education is we have all sorts of different people in it. Exactly. And, and I know some parents who really don't want their child to feel that they've been given a specific label because they want them to feel, you know, free to develop in any way they want. Um, is it then much harder to get an EHCP if you if you don't want to get a diagnosis? No, it will it will vary a lot depending on which local authority we're talking about. Um, there is a little bit of a variation there, but but no is the short answer. The EHCP assessment will take place anyway if you've requested it and I said you write a letter as a parent or guardian saying the needs that you see that this young person has and assuming that we are talking about you know a, a child who is old enough to be able to explain this themselves obviously their views are really really important mm. so the local authority they will want to speak to that child or young person to talk to them about what they're struggling with 
So that would be things like how do you prefer working and, you know, do you have difficulties organising your time and that kind of thing. They'd be asking those kind of yeah. questions. Yeah, and things like, you know, do you have difficulty with writing, things like that, with understanding what questions are being asked of you. So they, they will have questions that it's looking at, you know, does this young person have processing issues? You know, is there something going on with anxiety or communication, speech and language, things like that. That leads me to my next question, which is, are EHCPs solely for conditions? Or are they for, for example, mental health issues as well? You can get an EHCP for mental health health issues. One of the sections in the needs of the young person bit of the EHCP is for social, emotional and mental health. So you can get EHCPs for support with anxiety, um, depression, all sorts of sort of mental health concerns that might be going on for that young person. Yeah, your, your child theoretically could be kind of neurotypical, but be, be suffering maybe trauma from school or maybe they're having that kind of, you know, anxiety in their teens. And then they, you, as a parent, you could apply for an EHCP for those, for, for things that perhaps are more temporary. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And my next question then is how regularly are EHCPs assessed, you know, to, to keep, keep them continuing? So the standard there is once a year. So once it has been written and signed off and agreed, you will then have an annual review meeting. And that will be with the child or young person, um, anyone who works with them. So for my students, I go. Mm. So that uh, their parent or guardian um, and a representative from the local authority. That's for them to decide whether they're going to continue funding the needs on the plan. So it's less about are we going to keep funding it? Because once you've got one, it's I know a lot of parents do worry about this. I've had a lot of parents say, I'm so worried about all this funding is going to get taken away. Chances of that happening are minuscule. What the annual review is about is looking at are what is what we are funding the right support for that young person as they are currently. Because obviously the idea of the EHCP of having that support is that that young person will progress, that they will achieve some of the outcomes that have been set out for them in the EHCP, that their needs will change over time because certain things for them will get easier. As they get older, their needs will change. So that annual review is about everyone who works to support that young person just sitting, sitting down and saying, are we funding the right things? What needs to change? What needs to be updated? So it's really about whether they're being efficient rather than pulling the funding. Yeah. yeah. And it's about making sure that that support is right for that young person. So is that still what they need? Can we change that support to make it fit better with the situation that young person is in at that moment? Because, you know, what was funded three, four years ago for that young person when they are 10, 11 or 12, when they're 15 or 16, mm. they might need very different things. I see exactly what you mean. Are there any conditions that aren't covered? So, for example, um, I'm guessing dyslexia is a good example of something that is that is like a kind of I think I think it's considered an additional learning need but I'm guessing that wouldn't be enough to get you an EHCP for example are there things that aren't that you know if your child has you can be like that's you're unlikely to get an EHCP for that so dyslexia you can get an EHCP for the main reason for that is things like access arrangements for exams so a young person with dyslexia might have an EHCP that says they need 25% extra time to take exams or that they will use a computer or they will have someone to scribe for them hmm. rather than having to handwrite everything. So I've seen quite a lot of those. Um, interestingly, the other week I managed to hop onto a talk uh, by a lady from the National Autism Society about a diagnosis that is not covered in all local authorities <laughs> uh, and that is PDA this is pathological demand avoidance mm -hmm. um, 
it is not universally acknowledged as a diagnosis. So some local authorities will give you an EHCP with that diagnosis on it, others will not. So that very much depends on which local authority you are talking about. Um, that is changing. More and more local authorities are accepting that as a diagnosis, but it is still not everywhere. So that's like a trickle effect. It's slow, slowly yeah. getting more accepted. Um, yeah. And what are the most common scenarios that would get you an EHCP? So if there's anyone listening and their child has X, Y, Z, what, uh, what are the most common ones that, you know what, if your child is this or has this, then they're much more likely to be able to get an EHCP? Uh, so I would say any sort of specific learning need that has been diagnosed. So ADHD, ASD, uh, dyslexia, things like that. Um, any sort of physical need. So if you have a young person who is a wheelchair user, things like that, that obviously comes with an EHCP. That's quite an easy one to, to explain. Um, things like speech and language, communication difficulties, processing difficulties, uh, those are quite common. And so all these EHCPs, they must be unique to the child. They must be developed uniquely for the child. They are, yeah, it is a very long document. It is very detailed, uh, which is as it should be. Uh, they are completely unique to that young person. So the, the sections within it will be the same, but obviously the information within that will be different. Um, so you have that, that context bit at the beginning. You have details of the needs of that young person. You then have the outcomes that you would like for that young person. And when I say you, I mean what the local authority would like, what the school would like, if there is one involved, but also really, really importantly, what the parents and the young person themselves would like to achieve as a result of this support. Is there an argument then that having an EHCP can be quite limiting as a home educator because the local authority then has more input about the outcomes that it wants for the child? I would say it's a negotiation. Um, particularly now that we've moved into the EHCPs rather than the statements, there is a lot more space for particularly what does that young person want to achieve, uh, which I think is is great. That's really, really important because it's all very well me as a teacher saying, well, I think you would, I would like you to have done X, Y and Z by this point. But, you know, it needs to be what does that young person want to achieve? So I think you will have an ongoing communication and relationship with the local authority once you have an EHCP because you'll have those annual review meetings. Um, so you will be in contact with them. But it is always a negotiation. So I'd say don't don't be afraid of, of that, of having that relationship with the local authority, because it most of the time it works brilliantly. They want to support that young person as much as you do. So there is always a bit of a negotiation, particularly when it comes to funding. Um, but keep that conversation open, keep that dialogue coming and you will all get where you want to be in the end. And I was going to ask you about the funding. What is the main support that EHCPs offer? Is it funding, money, money for stuff, money for resources, money for tutors? Or is it more, I, I don't know, more advice based? So. It'll be the, the sort of the first thing that they'll do is look at sort of access arrangements. So that is, you know, whether it be for exams or it's what does that young person need to be able to learn in a sort of everyday scenario. So that might be they'll provide um, a computer, a laptop. It might have dictation software on it mm. that they might pay for mm. to help students for whom writing is really challenging. Um, it can be lessons with people like me, or there are online learning platforms that the local authority might pay for. Um, it can also be things like requesting a specific school or college for that young person. So you can have a named school on the EHCP. If you wanted your so, child to go to a specific school, for example, like a special yeah. school. Yeah, so if you had a particular school in mind that you thought that would provide the right support for my child, my young person, you can request the local authority to include that in the EHCP. They will obviously have to 
get agreement from that school. So they'll go to that school and they'll say, we have a child who would like to have you on their EHCP. But once that has happened, if that school is then named on the EHCP, then your child will go to that school, regardless of where you live, regardless of the number of students already at that school. Once it's in that document, they will go to that school or that college. Can you also specify a particular tutor that you want to work with? Because I know there's certain tutors like yourself that are kind of pre-authorised by the local authority. But can you, for example, if you know a tutor who's a specialist in X, Y, Z, can you can you uh, specify a particular tutor that you want to use? Or does the EHCP have a bank of tutors that it uses? So you can request a particular tutor. What would usually happen then is that that will come under the personal budget. So if you say, oh, I have a particular tutor that I know that I want to use, then the local authority might say, OK, we're going to include a personal budget in the EHCP for tuition for that subject. And then it is for that parent, that guardian to decide how that money is spent. I was going to ask you about that because I was going to ask about the financial side. So there's a personal budget that goes to the parent and the parent decides how it's spent. Or is there a personal budget that goes to the parent and it's specified what they spend that money on? So if you have a personal budget included in the EHCP, which is that is something that you request, something that is agreed, it's not in all of them by any means. So you that will be money that is directly sent to the parent it does often come with we want it to cover these things so for example i've seen quite a few of my students have a personal budget for life skills so that is money that they can use to go out and do things with a tutor maybe or with a learning support assistant to help teach them life skills um, or it might be for a particular tutor or a particular activity. Uh, so, for example, one of the students that I work with at the moment, he has a personal budget and some of that goes towards um, booking badminton sessions at a local sports club so that he can get a bit of um, exercise and physical activity. So it will often come with not very specific sort of instructions, but sort of a little bit of a scope of what that is in theory for yeah but it gives you a lot more say over that so you know it would be it's for life skills but actually specifically what it is spent on would be up to you yeah. or it's, so it's for like, physical a activity category but yeah but you choose yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about if you don't have a personal budget specified in the EHCP? Is, is that then, are things then just kind of provided? So the local authority would be like, here is a laptop with dictation software. Here is a tutor who you can work with. Yeah, exactly. So if it's not a personal budget, then it is items on the EHCP that are then being funded. So yes, it will be, we've said we'll fund a laptop. So we will buy one, we will send it to you. We interrupt this broadcast to remind you to like and subscribe to our podcast. And don't forget to join our Home Education Matters Facebook group, where you can find details on all our podcasts, any links or resources mentioned, chat to our guests, request upcoming podcasts, and even come on the podcast yourself. Do join us over there. You mentioned in our last podcast how important you thought it was to have consistency when, you, when a child comes out of school. And you said how important it was that you just show up every week as, as their tutor. Um, and it really resonated with me what you said. And, and I suppose that there may be some concern from parents that if they get an EHCP and their child kind of bonds with this tutor that the local authority is providing, that the local authority can just kind of whisk them away again. I would say that is very unlikely to happen. <laughs> um, so I have a student that I've worked with for four or five years now. So that was he had an EHCP when I started with him, but it was very different because he had just come out of school. So it was a very different EHCP. It did not cover much of his home education. So I have worked with him, you know, throughout the whole process of his EHCP being changed in order for that move to home education. Um, so we have a really, really good relationship. Like I have known him for a long time. I've seen him grow from you know, this very quiet, very anxious child to 
you know, a grown up as he is now, which still <laughs> terrifies me. <laughs> um, and at no point has the local authority ever suggested changing his tuition and using someone else. All that happened when he moved from a school setting to a home education setting is that provision, they, they increased it. So he now has an additional teacher to me. He has a learning support assistant. So, But at no point was it ever suggested that I would not be able to continue with him. So there's continuity in the local authority, even if maybe there's local elections or anything like that. Maybe it changes from like Labour to Conservative or, or vice versa there's still continuity within that department. You know, there's never that sense that all oh, things are going to change this year because there's elections or other other parties have taken over. No, no. No one in the local authority is going to sit down and read through all those EHCPs and go, right, we're going to change all of these things <laughs> <That's> <laughs> because reassuring. of the election. Yeah, and I know that is something that parents worry about a lot. I have had a lot of parents come to me, particularly around annual review time, getting very concerned that this meeting means that everything is going to change. Um, and it it won't. Uh, because the local authority, if we're being completely honest, they don't have the time to be messing around with these things <laughs> over and over again. If it's working, their, you know, their view of it is great. It's working. Carry on. Once you've sort of like got your evidence and you've got your EHCP, then generally it ticks along okay. Yeah. The only time it would really change is if you had an annual review meeting and it was agreed that it just wasn't working, that things needed to change because it was not working for that young person. And that would be the parent and the child and the local authority all agreeing these things. Yeah. And anyone else who works Mm. with them. So I said, when I go for my students, it's me, it's other teachers that work with them. You know, it might be physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists you know, learning support. It's anyone who works with that young person is invited. Obviously, with work commitments, not everyone might be able to attend every time. But anyone who works with that young person is invited to come and say what they think is working, if they think anything needs to be changed, what progress that young person has made over the last year. Mm -hmm. So and anything that changes as a result of that is agreed by everybody. And everybody needs to agree, or can there be like majority votes or anything like that? Uh, It probably would go with a majority, um, Mm. particularly if we're talking, you know, lots of people working (laughs) with that young person. Um, And the local authority will have the final say. But I have never been to an annual review and come out of it thinking, well, they didn't listen to what I said. They're going to change things and I don't agree. Yeah. Mm. Or what the young person said or you know, I've never come out of a meeting and gone, well, they're going to change things and we haven't agreed to it. Because uh, they, they won't. They won't do that. That's reassuring. The reason yes. they have those meetings is because they want to hear what the people who know that young person think of the support. So really, it's it's almost like they're there to collect as much information from the professionals and and the parent and the child as possible and then they put that all together and use that as their decision so they're not they're not going to trump it with their decision in that way yeah exactly Mm -hmm. and what about england uh, what about england versus wales versus scotland do you know if there's much difference in the systems between the different places now as i understand it having never worked in wales or scotland myself the system in wales is a bit different Um, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest, what the differences are, but I know they have a slightly different system. And as far as I'm aware, Scotland is pretty similar. Okay. So they, what you would get in Scotland, as far as I understand it, is quite similar to what you would get in England, but Wales has a slightly different system. So if you're listening in Wales, it might be worth going onto your local group and asking about information from anyone who's got an EHCP, for example. Yes, it would. (laughs) Is it all called the same thing, though? Is it called the same everywhere? As far as I know, yes. <laughs> okay, because I know that Wales does like to have its own terminology for most things, as does Scotland, actually. So, Yeah, but I'm sure if you went online, went onto Welsh government websites, they would be able to say, in Wales, we call it this, and this is how mm. it works. So my last question to you is, 
Well, it's a two part question. So what would you say are the downsides of getting involved in the whole EHCP process as a parent, as a home educating parent? And then I'm obviously going to follow that up by asking you all the good sides <laughs> as well. <laughs> um, well, the only thing I would say that might be a downside for some home educating parents is that you then do have other parties involved that you have to work with. So I can imagine that some home educating parents, particularly if they are home educating by choice, because that's something that they feel is best for their family and best for their child, they might find it a little bit difficult to have to work with all these different groups because you will have to work with the local authority. You might have to also work with tutors that maybe you are ones that you wouldn't choose. Um, although I would say with that, if you have a tutor and you feel it's not working and you're not happy with it, you can go to the local authority and say, actually, I would like a different tutor, please. You don't have to wait for the yeah. annual review for that. No. So once you're out of the school system, the school is not involved in the HCP anymore, right? Uh, yeah. Once the HCP says home education on it, the schools are, are not not involved. Great. So they can't they can't be involved. They can't sort of like um, they they can't change the dynamic of the EHCP or what's chosen at any point. Once you're home educating, no teacher can come no. in and say anything. Okay, good. No. So the only thing that might still be on your EHCP um, if you had a child that was in school and got taken out of school and is now being home educated is things like exams because. If that young person is planning on taking GCSEs, A-levels, anything like that, it has to go through a an exam centre with a centre number, and that is usually a school. So what you might have on your EHCP is that that young person will go back to that school to take their exam, so just for the day to do the exam, and then the exam will be submitted through the school centre number. So the local authority, they would... Um, specify that you're not using an independent exam centre, for example, that you're going to use your local school. And I'm guessing, is that because they fund the exams, the local authority, if you have an EHCP? Uh, yeah, so they will. Um, and that that comes as an agreement with the, the parents and the school. So wow, if you're not happy with your young person going back to that school to take their exams, you can say that. Mm, so they could then go somewhere right. else but so you're saying that if you have any hcp and you want your you want your child to sit gcse's then the, the local authority funds those yep that can be included in the provision on the ehcp um mm. so i have a student that that is the case for him currently it is in his ehcp that he is going to take english maths and science and that will be paid for by the local authority so for example if you had a child uh, an autistic child and they wanted they were very bright and they wanted to sit like 10 GCSEs the that would be part of the EHCP would be they get to sit these 10 GCSEs at the school and it's all paid for yeah that you can go back to a school and it will go through their centre number there are certain cases where you could take the exam at home and have it still go through a school's centre number that takes a little bit of organising though so I'd say you've really got to be on it and get that put in place well before the exams are taken. So you're talking um, like a couple of years before. It's worth starting the conversation about how you want that to happen nice and early. Because we do um, have parents that come on home ed, home ed sites and they say, is there any way my child can sit their GCSE at home? And pretty much everyone comes on and says, no, <laughs> it really <laughs> isn't possible. So are you saying that if they have an EHCP and you've got enough time, it's something that you could actually try to put in place? You can. It is a tricky one. Um, it is not an easy thing to do because um, you need to have a a registered centre with a centre number who are willing to submit that young person's exams through their centre number, potentially without ever having met this young person or knowing anything about them or the grades that they might get. Um, and obviously, if you're doing it at home, then it has to be agreed that there will be funding for an invigilator because we cannot just take people's words for it that these have been done under exam conditions. There will have to be an independent image later who comes to the home. Um, and interestingly, something I found out quite recently, if that young person is using a scribe for their exams, you then need two independent invigilators, one to watch the student and one to watch the scribe. 
Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so suspicious. <laughs> So what would you say are, I feel like we've drifted onto the good sides of an EHCP there. And one of them is that they fund the exams. But um, what are, what are the, what are the real positives about getting an EHCP if you're a home educating parent and a home educated child? I think the biggest positive that I have seen for my students is that it then becomes a lot easier to build up this network of people that will support that young person. So, for example, the student that I mentioned earlier, when I first started working with him, it was just me. I had two hours a week with him and it was just me. I was the only support apart from obviously his parents. Whereas now, having gone through that process of getting his EHCP changed, he has me. He has a learning support assistant. He has a separate maths teacher. He has a speech and language therapist he has an occupational therapist he goes to equine therapy there's all of these people that are surrounding this young person now who are all working to support him and want the best for him whereas before obviously you didn't have that so I think once you've got the EHCP and you can get these things in place all of a sudden you've got this group of people that are going to turn up to the annual review meetings and you've got people that you can you know as a parent I'm sure it must be quite nice to have other people that you can sit and talk to about how your child is progressing and what is going on with them rather than having it all land on your shoulders particularly if you're not home educating by choice. So in actual fact, what's fascinating is that your downside is the same as your upside. So the downside (laughs) is that is that parents have a lot more people involved. But the upside also is that parents have a lot more people involved. So it sounds it sounds like it's roundabout. Yeah, it's very much how the parent sort of sees it. So I'm guessing that there are some parents for whom having all that extra support would be wonderful. Because like you say, you've got people who are invested in your child's journey and who understand the unique abilities of your child. But then there's other home educating parents for whom that might be a total dystopian nightmare is all these people yeah. sort of trying to wrestle control of your child's education from, from you. So it sounds like that's actually, it's almost like a Marmite thing, you know, where you either yeah. going to love it or you're going to hate it. Yeah. And it can be a little bit of a transition. Um, so I know for some parents that I've met going from, having to fight for everything that their young person needs in education, you know, having to be that advocate for them at every possible turn. And going from that to suddenly you've got six or seven other people who stood there going, it's fine. We've got it. You don't have to worry. Like we're on this. All of us, like that can be quite difficult, I think, for parents suddenly sort of stepping back and be like, okay, there's other people here now. I don't have to do it all on my own. But quite nice as well, because I'm guessing that, that for example, somebody, you know, the person doing equine therapy, for example, might then at the annual review, annual review they may say things, things like, okay, I think they need speech and language therapy. And and so the professionals can actually all come up with ideas. So it is t- takes a little bit off your shoulders, doesn't it, as a parent? It does. It does. But I have seen um, with some parents that that is quite a difficult transition for them. It can be quite hard, I think, for some parents to trust these other professionals, particularly at the beginning when obviously you don't know us. You know, I can stand there and say, yes, I have the best interests of your child at heart. You don't know that that's true. And I understand that you don't know that that's true. So I think it can be a tricky transition for some parents. So I think I would say in that situation, just bear with it like see how it goes understand that it's going to take a bit of time for everyone to get used to a new way of working also maybe don't be afraid to say you know what this you know this person isn't isn't working for me and and so you surround yourself with the team that that you kind of want to be surrounded by exactly exactly yeah by all means say you know this person is not developing a positive relationship with my child I don't feel like this is benefiting them It, it is all about negotiation So do say when you think things are not working. It sounds like I think if you approached it in the right way, it could be a very empowering experience for you and your child. And I suppose it's one of those where 
once you opt out of the school system, you, it tend, things tend to be a little bit harder, you know, because the system is built around the, ma- the majority yeah. of rightly so. And so once you're making a, a non-conformist decision, then obviously things things tend to be a bit trickier. But thank you so much for talking us through the process of how to how to get an EHCP and, and how they work and what they look like. And I think that's really, really helpful. So where can our listeners find you on social media or if they wanted to get in contact with you or anything like that? I know you're on our Facebook group, Home Education Matters, so people can I come am. on <laughs> and ask you specific questions on there. But where can people find you when it comes to your businesses and things like that? Uh, so I am on the Satro website. So that is satro.org.uk. I'm there as the inclusion lead. So if there's something you want to talk to me about regarding that side of what I do, find me on there. I'm on Facebook as Karen Bonthron. Um, as you said, I'm on the Facebook groups. Or my self-employed email is kvb.tutoring at gmail.com. All right. Just say that one again for us kvb.tutoring at gmail.com that is fabulous i listen to so many podcasts and then they say things and i'm like i haven't got a pen i haven't got a pen write it down. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's wonderful thank you so much karen for coming on and talking us through ehcps and Anytime. if anyone has any questions do come on our facebook group and ask karen and i'm sure she'll be able to point you in the right direction of course of course i'm happy to help thanks karen it was lovely chatting today nice to see you again Thank you so much for joining us for today's Home Education Matters podcast. See you at the next one. Have a lovely day.